Hi, everybody. This is Michael Collo, Chief Economist at Fathom AI, a Pearson company. I'm joined here today by Matt Costa from New South Wales Treasury. Hello, Matt. Good day, Mike. How are you? Very well, thanks. Yeah, it's a Friday afternoon, just pushing on to the weekend, basically. Beautiful. I, I, I must say, the stereotype of the Australian weather is confirmed. It's 26 degrees outside for anybody listening. Beautiful blue skies, I think, probably where you are as well. And the weekend is looking glorious. So it's a great time to have a, a, a quick chat with you. Just to start with, what I was hoping to ask you, just a little bit about yourself, Matt. So love to hear about what area of the Treasury you work in and, and indeed how you came to be here in your career, where you started from, how you ended up in this line of work and, and what is it that you do? Sure. Well, I work in the productivity reform branch of New South Wales Treasury, supporting the New South Wales Commission for Productivity. So the kind of work we do is really fun. We get to look across the entire New South Wales economy, look at regulatory and service delivery issues across the whole swathe of policy that the state government does and look for opportunities to uh, improve productivity, improve service delivery. It's a really wide brief. And so it's really fun work to do. In terms of how I got here, it's, it was a long and winding path. I get bounced around in my education in a few different areas before I finally wound up here in economics. I started off doing accountancy at university, but I really wanted to look at big picture thing. So I sort of made a switch to philosophy and went very deeply into that political philosophy, philosophy of language, a whole bunch of different issues, got to the end of that and then thought, well, I actually, actually need a job now. And I did that, that thing where you're either good at maths or humanities. And so when you're better at humanities, you go and you do law. So I did that and ended up beginning in law, had a taste of that, but really was quite passionate about policy. And so I began my career in earnest in the federal government, starting out in the Australian federal government in the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. And it was a really fascinating experience looking at all of those national policy issues. And I landed at the end of my grad program in the um, economic part of the department. And I was, of course, trained as a lawyer and philosopher, not as an economist, and just had that exposure to all of the stuff that economists do. They had their uh, CGE modeling and looking at all those big picture issues and just became really fascinated with economics and economic policy. And that sort of led me to eventually go off and study them. But of course, I didn't study them in the usual way. Being a philosopher by background, I started reading Adam Smith and then started reading even earlier economic texts and eventually went off and did a PhD in economic history and the history of economic thought. So I guess I come to economics in a bit of a lateral way. I don't have that quantitative background that a lot of economists do have, but I get to work with the quantitative economists and it's a really fun dynamic bringing those different skill sets. I mean, that's fascinating. I, I, I had no idea of the richness of that philosophy background. I kind of sensed it in some of our conversations before, but this is the first time I've kind of heard you talk about it. So does that help you, I suppose, contextualize a lot of these ideas in economic, the history of economic thought and, and that type of idea? Is that, because I, I think that'd be quite a powerful thing to think of the idea that economic policy or in the government policy or economics full stop are kind of have recurring themes in them. And then they kind of go through different cycles of emphasis or importance, for example. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that I find quite funny about where I've ended up, I mean, one of the big issues I work on is the future of work, but I'm actually, in terms of my research background, actually really focus on medieval economic <laughs> history. So I kind of know about the past of work, but work on the future of work. But of course, there's such fascinating issues that come up over time, really fascinating confluences between those two areas. Let me ask you a, another question and kind of take you in that direction. So you mentioned that it was the history of economics and the, the history of work juxtapositioning with the future of work. There is a school of thought that says that history doesn't repeat, but it does rhyme. And this idea that things are on, there's no new ideas, there's just the recycled ideas. In your work in the future of work and how that might impact things like productivity and the workforce and so on, do you see parallels with history? Do you see elements that are very similar 
Or do you kind of genuinely think that a lot of this stuff is very different? Absolutely. I definitely see parallels. A really great example is, you know, there's a lot of anxiety in the future of workspace around whether all the work is going to dry up, about where technology is just going to automate everything and we're going to be left with no jobs. And that sort of narrative or fear comes up all the time. And really, funnily, it's something that's existed in the history of economic thought for an incredibly long time. One of the thinkers I looked at uh, in my research was a contemporary of David Ricardo, 19th century, early 19th century political economist, Sismondi. And Sismondi painted this scenario of automation quite famously, this idea that, well, potentially we could have all the work automated and you could just have the king sitting on a throne next to a crank, pulling the (laughs) crank and and (laughs) everything in England is produced. And then the question becomes, well, where are all the jobs going to come from. And and fortunately, despite the sort of persistence of that narrative, what we see through history is that we do automate an enormous number of things and we come up with amazing new technologies, but human beings are so good at doing things for each other. We always find ways to serve each other in in a market economy. And so that creates jobs and and we don't know what those jobs are going to be, but they do appear. And I think that that's an interesting question. So when you look at an economy like New South Wales or like any economy, let's say, how do you know which jobs are going or coming or indeed how long it will take to appear? Because I, I feel like there's a fair amount of voices in this conversation who essentially take economic development for granted. Like there's a sense that economic development just happens in the background. And because it happens, industries rise and fall, jobs change, the retraining is required. And AI is no different to that. So we're going to have AI come through. It will dispose some people. It will come up on the other side. But when you kind of dig underneath that question and you say, yes, but how many people and where and for how long and what is the retraining required and who's going to take care of it? Given that we've got examples of displaced populations around the world where industries have changed and actually never really recovered. So think Welsh towns, think UK manufacturing, think US mid- Midwest, et cetera. I feel like we're a little bit playing with fire and, and we're really a little bit like taking for granted that some of these things will kind of just happen. Just love to get your thoughts on, on how you think about that process and especially in the context of the history as well. Absolutely. Well, I mean, one of the things that it's, you know, proven itself not to be very good at over time is prediction. But unfortunately, as policymakers, we have to be in that game. We have to try and anticipate what's going to happen and we have to use the best tools we've got available. We know that technology comes in waves. It it doesn't roll out evenly. So that means there's an element of uncertainty about how big shocks are going to be, which uh, industries are going to have, you know, smooth transitions and more difficult transitions when a new technology comes online. So there's a lot of trend spotting and, and just looking at what's out there and talking to people and and trying to keep across emerging trends. There's also other approaches like projecting historical trends. One of the things that we uh, did for our intergenerational report, actually using Fathom's model that we use here at Treasury, was projecting out historical trends in the changing composition of the workforce. And those trends are over decades. And so we have some sense that they're potentially going to continue over time. And and looking at those long-term trends, we can have a pretty good guess of where things are going. Of course, yes, transitions are are a big issue. And I think it's something that government thinks about very actively. We've had in Australia, the transition of the automotive manufacturing industry. And, you know, it seems to be a matter of spotting what's happening at at the time and and coming up with an orderly. And I think that's a really good point because it's it's so interesting. You're talking about like gradual trends, which you observe, like things like climate change or technology and so on, which kind of slowly bleeds away an industry or makes it rise, for example, creates all kinds of distortions in the workforce market, such as skill shortages and so on. Um, I find interesting with COVID, it's a very different type of beast, right? There's a shock to the system. The system kind of moves immediately left. Had we been sitting here talking two years ago, the notion that we're uh, walking around with masks and having our phones voluntarily tag us into places and monitor us would have seemed very alien to us. And I'd love to hear a little bit about how you think the world of work or indeed productivity has changed in your view because of COVID or the work that you've done in this area. Yeah, absolutely. COVID has just, one of the things that's 
really highlighted for me is that social element of technological change. Just because a technology is there doesn't mean it's going to be implemented. And in COVID, one of those big things that we've seen is this rise of remote working. And what we saw was just this incredibly rapid transition of a very large chunk of economies across the developed world, but certainly in New South Wales and Australia, transitioning to very high rates of remote working relative to what was going on before the pandemic. And what's amazing about that is all that technology was largely in place. And if it wasn't in place, the transition couldn't have happened so quickly. And certainly we're still getting used to that transition and and investments are being made, but it really illustrates that rapidity and unevenness of technological uptake, the way that it happens in the real world, and the need for government to be nimble and to be able to respond to that and I suppose facilitate those changes and make sure that regulatory settings are not getting in the way of those changes and allowing them to to happen and allowing that adaptation to happen. We actually have been following the issue of remote working since perhaps May last year when the first lockdown sort of happened in New South Wales. We saw this huge rise in remote working and actually launched a a project called our New South Wales Remote Working Insights Project. The aim of that was we knew something big was happening, but the question was, well, okay, is this going to keep happening? What are the implications of this? What does this mean for the economy? Is this something that's going to rise and then recede back into the background, depending on the way the pandemic plays out? So we launched this project and it had a number of sort of objectives to it. One was to sort of get a read on how much remote working was actually happening in the economy. So we did a survey of 1,500 remote workers across the state in different demographic groups and regional and metro areas to try and get a read on that. Another thing we did was a bottom-up analysis of just that underlying capacity for remote work. So using Fathom's platform in which really fortuitously, I think Fathom rolled out the resilience module, which basically did a ground up analysis of the capacity of the New South Wales workforce to work remotely, that underlying capacity, you know, based on analysing the tasks involved in every single job across the economy, and then aggregating that up to an economy wide. And we found that 44% of all work in the New South Wales economy is now potentially remotable. And in fact, during lockdown, and you know, we're obviously currently still in a lockdown, a second lockdown this year, we estimate around 43%. So very close to maximum capacity remote working is happening across our economy. But the really interesting thing that we found, and we've just released our second report in this series, is that when restrictions eased off, things didn't revert back to the way they were. People kept working remotely, not at those high forced rates when we're all obviously compelled by circumstances to work remotely, but but people really, having tried it, employers and employees discovered that they liked it. And there appears to have been just this huge institutional shift. And one of the big findings in our uh, latest report is that based on those experiences when restrictions were eased earlier in the year, around 30% of all work in the the New South Wales economy continued to be done remotely. And that the economic value of that is around $165 billion a year. So that's just a huge change in the way work is done. And it came on very suddenly. And it really, to me, illustrates that in this world, one of the, the big things I guess I've noticed across my public service career is that it's more and more volatile. Things appear very suddenly, they're very difficult to anticipate, Uh, things like COVID, things like bushfires, they're events that are inherently unpredictable and you have to be able to get across them quickly and respond to them quickly and remote working is one of those and they often have really big long-term implications which require adjustments to the kind of long-term projections that governments make, projections about where to put infrastructure, where people will be living and working. So it's a challenging environment, it's a fascinating environment to work in. It's also a fascinating environment to be working in the government because I think everything you've said, I agree with. And it's almost like 
what COVID, I think, did globally is remind us that when the um, bad things hit the fan, so to speak, there's a central agency called a government that basically tells us what to do. And whether you've a country that went on strike because of it or didn't, generally there was a look to the government to help sort out the problem and to organize it and so on. And so this idea that government as a result became a custodian of its citizens made decisions and weighed off very difficult things to weigh off, right? Personal freedoms versus collective benefit, public health considerations versus Mm -hmm. economic considerations, and had to do that rapidly, had to do that in a data-informed way, had to do that through discussion and so on, put so much more, I suppose, weight and of sophistication of analysis and thought and so on in a centralized place, such as a government to execute on. And I think the actions of these governments around the world will, as you said, be felt for years and years to come. The decision by the Swedish government not to lock down versus the German government to lock down and those kinds of things were quite important, not only for the lives immediately, but for then the economic consequences and the the centralization of authority. So I think it's a really interesting time to be in government because the weight of the decisions as well that that are happening because of these things and longer term implications as well. I I suppose there's a few other questions I want to ask you about this kind of thing. So when you think about then, maybe this is a, a slightly geeky question, but come with me on this one. So if the world is so unpredictable and there are these events that happen, how do we think about modeling? Because when we're modeling, I mean, you mentioned general equilibrium models a moment ago, and they're kind of nice and tidy long-term averages, and they kind of float off into the infinite. Most of macroeconomics and most economic planning and idea and methodology is naturally predicated around these long-term averages, which make a lot of sense if you're just kind of looking for the average solution, the average long-term solution. And that makes, I think, a lot of sense unless the interim noise it sets you on a very different path. And then the path dependency then takes you in a very different direction. So how do we think about that from a kind of strategic planning, as you said, infrastructure investment, for example, where people will live and so on, are difficult long-term decisions to make under that type of uncertainty? Absolutely. And I suppose one of the things that uh, we, we have to resist is fixing on uh, one particular scenario, projecting out the past. And the more that things become uncertain, the more we look for certainty and something to to cling to. And absolutely in in modelling, one of the big things is trying not to do that. And scenario modelling is a huge part of that. I think you're touching on, I guess, something relevant to another piece, big piece of work that I've been working on and the Productivity Commission has been working on coming out of our intergenerational report, which does model our Treasury's central long-term projections around those big economic numbers like productivity, workforce participation, economic growth, those sorts of numbers. Once you've done that, then you need to think about different scenarios. And some of the scenarios we're exploring at the moment are around the future of work and how technology and automation might impact the New South Wales workforce and how that could take us away from exactly that central case, the different kinds of worlds we could end up in. And I think what's really interesting is in a world where there's a lot of downside risk, where we have things like bushfires and pandemics and an earthquake the other day, um, yeah, trifecta of disasters, One of the good things about this area is of technology and automation is there is some upside risk to automation. And that is that one of the challenges we've had across the developed world is slowing productivity growth and technology and automation. We know it comes in waves. We know you can have slow periods followed by real growth spurts and we we can see these technologies on the horizon. So one of the really fun and positive things we get to do here is model what's the scale of that upside risk? What sort of positive shock could we get from new technologies coming online and really boosting our productivity and creating more goods and services with less resources and effort and continuing that growth in our living standards? So in our adaptive workforce project, Again, using the Fathom economic scenario model, we're currently looking at different potential scenarios around technology and automation and the sort of magnitude of positive shock to productivity flowing on to economic growth and other 
of those macro variables. Um, another really interesting thing in this area is that Fathom takes a, like as a government person, we deal with these big headline macroeconomic variables. And one of the really fun things about working with the Fathom model is it's a completely ground up approach. So we have the top down and the ground up meeting, and we have this bottom up analysis of how these different technologies could impact on different jobs, different industries, the, the, the tasks that people perform in their daily jobs. And we build that up to a macroeconomic picture and negotiating, working out how the, the central projection that's made in this very different methodology, this macroeconomic methodology, how does that match up to the possibilities that our ground up analysis of how technology and automation can affect individual jobs Marrying those two things together is really fascinating. Because I think, I mean, certainly my work in this field, what I find often missing in that micro to macro lens is that the, the middle ground. So you have the macroeconomic information, which says, as you say, GDP growth, inflation, high level information that says about the velocity of the economy. But it doesn't really tell you if a 2% growth rate is because of mining boom or because of, I don't know, manufacturing or services and so on. And so this idea that every industry essentially can function very differently, some of our industries are very globally competitive. So if India wants more coal, then coal mining goes up. But if it doesn't, it doesn't. Whereas others are very domestically focused, but it's really domestic consumption. So there's this kind of assortment of different moving parts underneath that 2%. And each one of those different industries has also different implications for the workforce or the skills and future work and so on. And so I feel like it's one of those things that is quite evident if you're thinking about like industry development, for example, you're thinking, okay, what kind of industries do I need to attract into my workforce so that it can pay well and so on. And I think the remote working is a very interesting one because it's also, you know, how would you build an economy that would be very capable of remote working? Let's say that you knew for certain that you were going to require more remote working in the future, whether that's because of natural disasters, whether that's because of more viruses or whatever it might be. Which industries would you promote? Which industries would you grow and so on? And how you would mold and shape essentially workforce to be ready for the future of work if the future of work meant staying at home and working from home? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, remote working opens up some fascinating opportunities. I think historically we've been quite worried about outsourcing and the potential for secure jobs to end up going overseas. But the remote working shock really highlights that the, the opposite is also possible. You know, once you have people working remotely, there's the possibility of us effectively exporting services, becoming a service provider to the rest of the world using remote working. So there are upside risks there as well that's, that are really fascinating. And there's, I suppose, tension between, and especially when you're in government, we worry a lot about the, the, the danger of picking winners. But at the same time, if you don't plan for things, if you don't look ahead and ensure that regulatory environments are, that there's regulatory certainty and think ahead in issues, you also end up in trouble. So there's a, there's a thinking about the future, there's this tension between trying to take in a lot of data, but also trying to be reactive to what's happening, but also to be proactive because government can be a really important enabler to some of these transitions. And I think that's a fascinating thing. So, for example, as a government to encourage, let's say, remote working, probably Australia out of any country I could think of is probably the, one of the better position for that. Because you think about Tokyo, I'm not sure how you're going to get people to kind of stay at home if their living space is 20 square meters. And that's about it, right? There's not really the same. You'd have to open up. You'd have to create a lot more residential space. Uh, and obviously in Australia, there is a lot of that available and the rural communities that benefit from it. I suppose one of the other big things that comes out of all of this study is where we stand in terms of the skills and, and the training, right? So the future of work, as we discussed, I think is hard to forecast because we don't know what's going to happen. We, we think there are general trends, then we have these big shocks. So we use scenario analysis to kind of work through that. I mean, how do we therefore treat skills and education where they definitely feel like long-term investments in the, in the direction of a workforce uh, in terms of which way we should go? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think your point touches on another big sort of dichotomy that we have when thinking about skills. So you have these industries that are very high tech that are growth engines and they require 
really bleeding edge skills and innovation. And, and uh, I think that the term for it is often, the term that's often used is talent. And there's this global talent pool and there's a war for talent globally. And that's something that my colleagues in the Innovation and Productivity Council look at. So you have these bleeding edge innovators um, and you have the skills that they need. And we're thinking about STEM skills, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. But then you have this rise of the services. The more that we automate traditional industries like agriculture and, and manufacturing, the more that the bulk of work in the economy moves to these other areas, to the services, to health, to education, to some of those big industries. And so when we think about the skills of the future, they're the skills that are necessary in health, education, social assistance, aged care. So when we think about the future of work, we're often drawn to thinking about high tech, but actually the future of work is so much about social skills. So when looking across the bulk of the economy and the bulk of the workforce, we're really thinking about boosting skills, digital skills, being able to access digital services, being able to work with technology in those kind of ordinary ways that we work with. We want people to be able to work with technology every day and developing more of those soft skills that are really necessary when you've got a service-based economy. So, I mean, really interestingly, STEM is important, but it's also important to understand that it's going to be a, a relatively small part of the, the workforce really applying those STEM skills in a hardcore way to drive technology and automation forward, to drive our productivity up. But for the bulk of the workforce, we really need to be thinking about a very different set of skills in the future of work. It's so interesting that you're right. People confuse this notion of skill gaps, like vocational skill gaps. So for example, we need in the US more people in construction or, or we need more people in infrastructure. Those are just boots on the ground. I mean, they have some skill attachments to it, but essentially it's a labor force that's missing. They need another 5,000 people or 3,000 people. They need to mobilize and somehow get people into those jobs. But essentially that skill gap is the fact that people haven't been doing apprenticeships, haven't been going through that system. And as you said, for example, aged care, social housing, healthcare are all areas where we need people. We need warm bodies mm -hmm. essentially to carry out those tasks and they need to be taught how to do that. But essentially that's what they're doing. Whereas people then confuse that with this idea of a generic layer of digital skills that I think all jobs in all most industries require to essentially uplift whatever they're doing in whatever the industry they're in to a higher level so that people can progress within those industries or, or become more efficient or use technologies better or become essentially better and more productive citizens within their job. But it's more of a vertical ascension rather into a kind of a digitally enabled part of your job, I would think of. Whereas these types of models where I think you've got a large gaps in your economy. So as you say, space tech, while well, you need vocational training, it happens to be technology, but it's vocational training to get people into that area of the industry if you're going to develop it. Absolutely. Uh, there really, uh, another really interesting issue that comes up here is we're thinking about gradual change. And we've talked a bit about some of those big shocks where an industry undergoes a, a big change and you need to transition a workforce quite rapidly from one particular set of occupations to other appropriate occupations for those workers. But for most workers, it's a very gradual frog boiling in water sort of change and, and uplifting those digital skills. I think one of the other issues that we uh, really grapple with as a productivity commission is we know people are changing careers. We know people go through these career transitions throughout their lives. But as we're also having a more and more educated workforce, I mean, we've got the you know most educated workforce that's ever existed on the planet at this point in time, making sure that those that education doesn't become a barrier, that we don't have an overly credentialized economy where the drive to get education is inadvertently putting up barriers that that mean that people can't smoothly transition and can't leverage their existing skills into new areas. So this idea of smoothing transitions and making sure there aren't um, barriers to entry to new occupations that don't need to be there. Obviously, there are important regulatory requirements for many different occupations, but making sure you get that balance right and you don't have rising sort of credentialist requirements that are preventing people from uh, making those smooth transitions. I mean, it's so fascinating, this idea that um, 
if AI is coming and technology, as you said, moves in waves, the natural response of the workforce is retrain and redeploy across the entire workforce. And that takes time and it's costly. And so therefore, do you have that time and that cost borne by the companies as a way of saying, look, here's your stakeholders, your employees, it's worthwhile for you to retrain and redeploy, especially if there's skill gaps in the market, especially if you, it takes you time to find new workers and you like these workers because they kind of bought into your vision and so on. So it's worthwhile doing that versus a government-led initiative where basically the government says, look, we, we just structurally need more people that have these types of skills. So we're going to create lots of financial incentives for people to do those types of courses, to retrain, redeploy, either midstream or at the beginning of their career, because we just need to move the entire boat over, essentially. And how this would happen organically would be much smaller. Mm-hmm. I feel like governments around the world have taken a very different point of view to this. I feel like governments that are much more centralized, like so Singapore, Middle East, will take a much more, we want to understand and control our workforce, or at least kind of nudge it very proactively. Whereas other governments, I think that are a lot more sort of capitalist or kind of free market thinkers will kind of say, well, the economy will kind of sort that out. There'll be demand supply, mm-hmm. there'll be an equilibrium price. That price will justify you taking that course to get that job, et cetera. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I mean, in Australia, we've had, I guess, a move towards more demand-driven approaches, which really mean individual-centred. The individual identifies something that they want to go into. The government supports them to retrain and to skill up. And then they sort of come to market with a new skill set and and hopefully find a job. And I think there's a, a move, I guess, back towards more government guidance of that system because there really are, you know, as individuals, it's very difficult to keep track of different trends in what in occupations are growing in demand. There really is a role for government in guiding and incentivizing people to go uh, and train in areas where they're really, really needed. One of the things that the Productivity Commission emphasised in its white paper is the need to use skill subsidies and target them to areas of need and make sure that we're incentivizing people to go in the right areas. And, and so, of course, you've got different players playing different roles. You've got individuals um, becoming lifelong learners and and really pursuing that growth. You've got government uh, attempting to facilitate and add information into the market. And then, of course, you've got the employer role, which I think is something that's evolved over time and I guess is still evolving now. Yeah, most definitely. And as usual, the future of work it never arrives. It's always on the horizon. <laughs> so at yeah. any point in time, the future is not here. But look, it's been an absolute pleasure chatting with you as always, Matt. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much, Mike.